Praise the Lord. Good to be with you again this evening. And the uh, uh, trip was just about the same amount of time, but a little less stressful. So, <laughs> but we got here safely and uh, just thank the Lord for that. Busy days for us. And Simone is doing better with her cataract surgery. Every day she's just a little bit better. But pray for her because she's supposed to have another procedure on Tuesday for the left eye. So pray for her, please. Uh, of course, Sam Armalaputi, he's part of our ministry, Amelia. And Amelia's my granddaughter, by the way, Brother Sam. And it's uh, good to have Amelia and her husband, Michael, and Michael's mom, Julie, and his grandma, Nikki, uh, with us this evening again. And uh, Sam is not a gypsy, but he works with the gypsies in India, but he's still of the untouchables. And those are the lowest of the caste system of the Indian peoples. And uh, close your ears, Sam. I'm going to brag on you a little bit. I'm going to boast on you, but close your ears. But uh, Sam is a textbook missionary, uh, the real deal. I mean, this guy goes into places, and he's training pastors. He didn't say much about that in his video, but he's training pastors. This young man is training preachers, because many of the preachers in India don't have formal training. They, they feel called of God and just start serving but don't uh, know doctrines of the Bible, don't know church polity, and they're doing a great job. And as you see, they suffer great persecution, especially since they're the minority of India. But please pray for Sam. He just got to the States. Uh, matter of fact, he flew out the 14th and got here when? Yesterday. Yesterday. So he doesn't have his display. He doesn't have his prayer card. But Sam, maybe when you get your prayer card, you can mail some to the church. So Brother Joe can, Pastor Joe can get them to his people so they could pray for you. Please pray for Sam. And uh, I, I don't know how long he's going to be in the States, but pray for him. And then the, it's good to have Anna Ray, her husband, Rob, are in ministry too. They live up in the Wildwood area. And they are Sam's transportation. And, of course, a real dear friend, Tim, right? Is that right? Brother Tim is with us. And Levi is Anna and Rob's uh, son. It's good to have them here this evening. Of course, great to see you all. And just thank the Lord for the opportunity to be here. I hope that you're praying for the conference. We don't want to just scratch us some days off the calendar and say we accomplished what we set out to do. Because we don't want to satisfy our goals. We want to satisfy the goals of God. And I believe that this is a divine appointment. I said it here last night. I believe that Missions Conference is the most important meeting on the church's calendar. Because evangelism is that which is uh, nearest to the heart of God. And I need to say this, uh, we have 40-plus missionaries with our organization, many nationals with our ministry. We didn't set out to have nationals as a part of our organization, but God planned it that way. And Sam is one of the Roma Outreach Missions Association missionaries. We now have a Central America division. I was in Honduras in, I think, July, and established the Roma Outreach Mission Association of Central America and we added 22, almost doubled our family of missionaries, over doubled our family of missionaries. So you pray for Roma that God would just bless it in a great way. Let me remind you of my autobiography on our display, all the funds raised. I'm not selling them. I'm taking donations. Whatever you give, it doesn't make any difference. There's a little gypsy wagon. I didn't say this last night, I don't think, but there's a little gypsy wagon. If you'll put your donation in that wagon, and take a copy of this book. Let me say something about this book that I didn't say much about. The title of it is The Gypsy Beggar Saved by Grace, The Life and Ministry of Gypsy Evangelist and Missionary Walter Stevens. This is a great evangelistic tool. Matter of fact, I, I've been rereading it uh, just to find errors in it so that we could get it as close to perfection as possible. I'm, a, I'm OCD, by the way, and I love it. I wish everybody would. But... Uh, uh, as I was reading it, and I, I knew this, but it just reminded me, there is a place where I stop in the book and literally give an invitation and ask people to bow their head and pray to receive Christ. So it's a great evangelistic tool, but it's also a great tool to minister to the needs of grieving people because my late wife Dolly went home to be with Jesus in 2017, and God blessed, and I survived that grieving process. And so it, it, just pick up a copy, get it to a friend, Whatever the case may be, all the funds that we raise will go to help the Ukraine. We're getting money into the Ukraine. I don't have to tell you what's going on in Turkey. I don't have access to anybody in Turkey, but I know what I can do for Turkey is pray, is pray for them. And, you know, when I see videos like Sam, it reminds me, of, and we talked a little bit about last night, when you 
when you take God out of the equation, you end up with situations like in India, like in Turkey, and what I believe is coming down the pike here in America. I'm not a doomsday preacher, but I believe we can read the writings on the wall. And do you know what, uh, what Daniel read on the wall? Many, many tekel you farsen. You've been weighed in the balances and come up wanting. And I believe that God is going to weigh America in his balances unless there's revival. And I believe that we can pray for revival, and I can believe that we can see, we can usher in revival in our churches. I've learned this, Brother Joe, in the preaching of the Word of God. And I said tough things last night. I mean, I said things that go straight to the heart by the blessed Holy Spirit of God. But I always say this, when people know that you love them, you can say tough things. It's the source from which it comes. And I believe we saw just a little bit of revival here at this altar last night. Just a little bit of revival. Because if you challenge God's people with the truth, in love, by the blessed Holy Spirit of God, they'll be obedient. And we saw that last night, didn't we, here at the altar. And so I hope and pray that uh, we will see revival in our midst and that it'll be, be right here with us. I just want to go to one verse in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last night, I'm going to have to reiterate some things to get everybody. I, I won't stay long in that introduction. Uh, this is normally a two-part message. I turned it into a three-part message because the introduction is the message in of itself. But we're going to go really to the first point tonight, and then we'll end up to the second point uh, tomorrow night, which really the point, to the message, it's an eight-point message. <laughs> so it's, and I preached it in one service one time, but it's too difficult, and I want to keep people on track. Now, Simone said, uh, I said, did you get notes? Because she's an avid note-taker. And she said, no, you, you went over them too fast. And so I'll go a little slower if you're a note taker to write down the things that are important. And uh, my son Michael taught me this, Amelia, your uncle, taught me that you'll remember a small percentage of what you hear, you'll remember a greater percent, uh, percentage of what you see, but the greatest percentage of things that you'll remember is what you write down. It, like it almost becomes an imprint in your heart and mind. Ephesians chapter 3, just one verse, verse 20. Let's stand for the reading of God's word, and then I'll pray, and you may be seated. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pens these words, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You can't read that without reading verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you meet with us again tonight. I've prayed, I've studied, I'm prepared. Lord, thank you for Simone's song and that prepares our hearts knowing that you're a God who wants to work in our life and we'll just hold on just a little bit longer, God. We'll see you work in a great way. Thank you for my precious brother, Sam Armalapudi, Lord. I love this man. And Father, not just because he's a part of our organization, but he's a special man. And your hand is upon him, and I'm honored that he's a part of our mission family. Bless him, Lord. Get him some rest. Get him some good meetings. Thank you for Rob and Anna Ray, who are hosting him up near Wildwood. Thank you that uh, Anna transported him here to the meeting. Thank you for Brother Joe allowing Brother Sam to be a part of the meeting tonight. Now, bless, Father, and meet with us, meet needs, and we'll be very careful to give you the praise and the glory and honor. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I said last night that we, in our ministry, whether it's among the gypsy people or whether it's a church service, I, I preach revivals, I preach missions conference, Bible conferences, I fill the pulpit, I fill the pulpit of a church that Anna and her husband used to be a member of in Fort Myers at Buckingham Baptist Church. We filled the pulpit there for the month of January. Simone and I went there every uh, Saturday and spent the night and ministered. But we come to each and every service with great anticipation. We expect God was, is going to work. And it's no different tonight. I expect God to work in this place tonight. Why? Because his word is being preached. And uh, I'm expecting great things. And I gave you five thoughts last night in introduction of why we can expect great things from God. Number one, I said... We can expect great things because of the power of God. Because of the power of God. Then I added this little tag at the end that has never abated. 
God's power never changes. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, to say the Lord which is and which was which is to come. The Almighty, and the all word name of Almighty is a noun. That's a name of God. He's the all-powerful God. So we can expect great things to happen in our lives and ministry and in our church and in our nation and our world because of the power of God that is never abated. Number two, because of the promise of God that is absolute. There isn't much absolute truth anymore. Truth has become variable. Uh, truth has become individual. My truth may be different than your truth. But the truth of the matter is there's absolute truth. Now, truth is a person. I am the way, the truth is life. If his power never bates, then his truth is absolute. Amen? And his promise that is absolute. He said, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. So, Number one, we can expect great things because of the power of God that has never abated, because of the promises of God that are absolute, and number three, because of the provision of God that is always available or accessible. I can stand here tonight behind this sacred desk, by the way, that belongs to another man, and I don't take it for granted. I know this is a guarded place. I know that Pastor Joe wouldn't allow just anybody to stand behind this pulpit and including honoring you, Brother Sam, by standing by behind her. But you know what? I can stand by here in the greatest of confidence, not based upon my gifts, not based upon my inability, my abilities, not based upon the lack of education, but based on the promise that God that he will provide. He's the great provider, and he'll provide me the words that I need to say. He will fill me with the Holy Ghost. I'm not concerned of what my tongue will say, what my lips will formulate, what my, th my mind will think, what my heart will sense, because I have a God who's on me and in me for this specific service tonight. So because of the provision of God that is always accessible, always available, Philippians 2.13, for as God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know what that verse means? That he gives you the willpower and the do power. Nothing is our idea. Nothing. It all comes, all the good things in our life, come from the heart and mind of God Almighty. God created long before he was born. He had in his plan a Sam Armalaputi. That was God's plan. That someday there would be a young man who would be born into this world that go, would go to the tribal peoples of India with the truth of the gospel. And he has provided for him. He is the God of provision. And because of prayer to God that he always answers. Now Simone sang about that in her song. We have a God that answers our prayers. The only problem with us is we expect immediate prayer. And sometimes God does answer immediately. But I always say there are four ways for God to answer a prayer. No is an answer. We don't like that one. <laughs> We want the affirmative, don't we? We want the yes, and we want it right away. No, we want it yesterday. But no is an answer. How about maybe? That's a conditional answer to prayer. God says, I'll answer. I'll do what you want if you do this. And we're going to be talking about that contract that we talked about last night in the message. Because we have a contract with God. And uh, another answer is uh, wait. That's the answer I hate. I hate wait. I told you last night, I don't think I would take 50 items to the 20 item. Check out at Walmart, a uh, $20 cashier at Walmart. And so wait. And then, of course, yes is an answer. And the Apostle Paul had visions of great expectations. We see it in the verse. Now, to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask here. Do you think God did exceedingly and abundantly above all in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul? I mean, this man turned his world upside down. I always say he didn't turn it upside down. He turned it right side up. But God used this man in mighty ways. So here's a man who realized Ephesians 3.20, that's why it was so easy for him to write about it. Not unto him. Who, who is him? That's Paul's God. Remember, my God shall supply all your needs. Paul's God. Who's our God? And because our God and Paul's God is the same God, then Ephesians 3.20 applies to us too. Help me, church. That we can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask for things. We quoted William Carey last night, the modern, uh, father of modern-day missions. He says, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Now, we also talked about last night that there is a working relationship with God 
a, a, an agreement, a partnership that we're supposed to have with him in order for Ephesians 3.20 to happen, in order for Ephesians 3.20 to be realized that we have a partnership. We do, God does his part as we do our part. We talked about confessing. If, if we confess, what will God do? He'll forgive, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Uh, if, uh, if we forgive, we will what? Be forgiven. He says, go, and he will be with us. You know what? There's no sense for him to be with us if we're not going. Hello? Uh, he says, pray, and he will answer. He has made a contract with his people. Let me give you a verse that solidifies that truth. It comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Watch what God says. If my people, today who's that? Christians, we're named after Christ. The Christ-like ones, that's what it means to be a Christian. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, that's our part, and pray, that's our part, and seek my face, that's our part, and turn from their wicked ways, that's our part, that's our part of the bargain. Watch what he says. Then I will hear from heaven. That's his part. Watch now. He won't hear from heaven until we uh, humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. He says, then will I hear from heaven. That's his part. We'll forgive their sin. That's his part. And we'll heal their land. Maybe we're not seeing a healing in this land, in our community, and everything is absolutely so wild weird, crazy, because we're not humbling ourselves, we're not seeking God's face, we're not turning from our wicked ways, and we're not praying in the will of God. And so therefore, we breached our contract with God. Hello? And he's not obligated. He's not obligated. And so, missions conference, Sunday services, Wednesday service, Bible conferences, it's all about getting God's people to keep their part of the bargain, so to speak. So tonight, in our four points, we're going to talk about God's part in realizing great expectations. God's part. It's all going to come from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's God's part. It says here, Now unto him that is able to to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Here's God's part. God is able to do all things. Now unto him that is able. The Bible says there's nothing impossible with God. Amen? With men, some things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I know how limited I am. Walter Stevens, sixth grade educated, former carny Catholic gypsy, knows how limited he is. Therefore, I need a God that's bigger than me. I need a God that's bigger than any ministry burden that I carry. I need a God that's bigger than any problem, financial, medical, legal, relationship, whatever it can be. I need a God that's bigger than my problems. Watch now. He says he is able. God has the ability. I'm so glad that that's our God. God is unlimited in his ability to do great things. Matthew 19, 26, with God all things are possible. Our God, listen to me, church, our God is the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the everywhere present God at the same time. The Bible says that the darkness is light unto him. He doesn't know the difference. He doesn't need a flashlight. He doesn't need a lantern. He doesn't need any help to see in the dark because he's the all-knowing, all-seeing, everywhere present God. That should give you great consolation, but I know what you're thinking. Preacher, if he's the all-knowing, all-seeing, everywhere present, all-powerful God, why ain't he moving? Why ain't he acting? Why ain't he doing? Well, we've already said it's a contract. Hello? He will. He will use that ability as we invoke him in our life and ministry. When we invoke him, hey, listen, and not for personal gain. Hello? Didn't James say that when we pray and we don't get an answer it's because we ask amiss to consume it upon our own lust? Hmm? And that's because the goal of our prayer life predominantly is to better us. Do you know what the goal of prayers is? The go Thank you. Who said it? The preacher's wife. Hallelujah. 
The goal of prayer and answered prayer is for God to be glorified, not for my needs to be met. And you know what the byproduct is when God is glorified? My needs are met. But we're the proverbial put the cart before the horse people, aren't we? And we just don't get it. We just don't get it. But watch now. When the child of God comes to a place that everything in his life is about the glory of God, watch now. Your Christian life, your faith, your walk with God, your testimony, your witness will be dramatically and radically changed. I got a couple of hallelujahs out of it. Sam's sleeping. No, he's not. I'm playing. He's up. He's up. He is up. I know what jet lag is. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Christian life that I want. Because, watch now, prior to my conversion, everything was about me. That little girl over there never knew that grandpa. She only knew the saved grandpa. But there was an unsaved grandpa. <laughs> I, won't run, I won't run that rabbit trail because I don't like that guy. I don't like talking about him. But he's saved. He's under the blood. He's not proud of his past. Paul wasn't proud of the fact that he made havoc of the church. But the Bible says that he did. Why? To see a contrast to who he was and to who he is now. And, and I want to be a 1 Corinthians 10.31 Christian. Whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, do all to the glory of God. That's bottom line. I'm going to surprise you about something. I know this is missions conference. I know it's about getting missionaries to the field, keeping them on the field, supplying their needs, praying for them. I know what the missions conference is about. It's about souls, right? But you know what? Souls are not the primary goal. An independent Baptist preacher said that in our church? Souls is not the primary goal? No. Souls are a byproduct of my praise and worship of the King of kings and Lord of lords. When I worship him, when I praise him, when I serve him, when I glorify him, you know what I end up doing? Winning souls. And I heard Dr. Charles Keene, and I mentioned Dr. Charles Keene many times in my messages. He's probably one of my favorite preachers. He's the, one of the greatest missions preachers in all of America, maybe the world. He's pastor emeritus of the First Baptist Church of Milford, Ohio. You hear Bearing Precious Seed. That's the mother church of Bearing Precious Seed. Millions of Bibles, still preaching. I just preached a conference with him in September in Georgia. He could barely make it up to the platform. Pray for him. But I heard him say that he worships God from a platform of service. Huh? Amelia, we think worship is a song. We think worship is raising our hands. You can worship in a song. You, it's okay if you want to raise your hands. But just make sure they're holy because the Bible says lifting up holy hands. <laughs> oh, did you all get that? <laughs> lifting up holy hands. That means separated hands. We worship God from a platform of service. Worship is 24-7. It's not just Sunday. And in John chapter 4, Jesus is saying, said that God is looking for those type of worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Huh? And our charismatic brethren say that that word, true, uh, word spirit is the Holy Spirit. It's not in John chapter 4, verse 4. That word is the human spirit. Breath, life, it's the same word. In the Greek, Holy Spirit or human spirit, same word, pneuma. And what does the word mean there in that context? Because it's a small S spirit, not capital. It means with my breath, with my life, with my existence. We have a God who's able, and we, are, we will not see his ability. We will we'll not see that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. I will not live a mediocre Christian life. I will not. Because it's an insult to an Ephesians 3.20 God. Oh, please help me. Say amen to that one at least. It is an insult to an Ephesians 3.20 God for you and I to live medi mediocre Christian life. Now, I'm not talking about health and wealth. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a dynamic Christian life that when you walk into a room, someone says there's something different about that woman 
There's something different about that man. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is, but they're different, and they are better for being in your presence. Somebody should have wrote that down. This is good. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's able to do all. Our God is the all-knowing, the all-seeing, ever-present God. Therefore, we can do the impossible. We can reach those nationals in India, Brother Sam. We can reach him with the gospel. I see him. I see his pictures. I see his videos. He keeps me informed every week. Not because I demand you to inform me, do I? But he wants to share what God is doing in his ministry. He's a very humble servant. God is able. One of our greatest sins in the church today is putting limits on God because of our lack and our inability. Mark chapter 6, probably one of the saddest phrases in the word of God. Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, talking about Jesus. He could there do no mighty work. Did you hear that? He could there do no mighty work. Matter of fact, I preach a message from that verse entitled, When We Tie the Hands of God. What ties the hands of God? Watch what it says. He could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled, because, and he went about the villages teaching. I need more than a teacher. I need more than a healer. I need the God, the creator of all that is, was, and ever will be. I need that all-knowing, all-seeing, everywhere present God. How about you? Do you need him? I need that Ephesians 3.20 God. I want more than a teacher. I want the God who is able to do all. Number one, according to Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do all things. That's part of his part of the contract, by the way. We'll do, we'll do our part tomorrow night. But this is God's part of the contract that he is able to do. Number two, that he has an abundance of all. Look what the word says. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Well, it goes without saying, a God who is, uh, can do exceedingly must be the God who has abundance. Huh? God's resources never run out. He's the all-powerful God. He's the Jehovah God. He's the great I am, and he has an abundance of all. Watch, here's what we need to do. To tap in to the resource and the abundance of God, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about power and love and joy and wisdom. To tap into that power, to speak on behalf of God, to have the heart and mind of God. Can we have the mind of God? Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. And then he said to the Philippian church, let this, key word, let, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And as well allow. The mind of Christ wants to come in, watch now. But we have to allow. But what's happened to us, watch now. We've allowed the philosophy of the world to dominate our thinking. Whether you want to admit it or not, we all have been inundated with the lies and the philosophy of a fallen world. They've crammed it down our throats. It's quiet in here. <laughs> I, I don't want to get political, but, but um, in one realm, whatever you want to think about, it, whatever choice you made about the pandemic, whatever you believe about the pandemic, whatever you believe about COVID, that's your choice. If you decide to wear a mask, don't wear a mask, get vaccinated, don't, that's your choice. But I believe there's a lot of lies in all. And now we're seeing the ramifications of the lie. My executive director, Dr. Tim Clark, listen to this, Amelia. Dr. Tim Clark has had all the vaccinations, has had all the boosters, and he's had COVID four times. Now, why, why am I bringing that up? They got us. Hello? They got us. They, they filled it in. A, they crammed it down our throats. The CDC said, Fauci said, blah, 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 on and on and on. Now, I'm just using that as an example of how our minds have been infiltrated with worldly philosophy. But watch now. There is a wisdom of God that is high. It's a higher wisdom. You know, I always say the one that's higher has the better view. Huh? Huh? He has a better view of things, doesn't he? He sees things that we don't see. Now, Simone has heard this phrase that I'm about to say hundreds of times. 
I have a philosophy that I live by. And you know what, Simone? I've never used that philosophy in my own life. I've never said that. But here's my philosophy. When you can't see, hang on to somebody who can see until you gain your trust. And in this, in the context of what I'm talking about, God can see. Let's hang on to him. Huh? Let's hang on to him. He has the abundance of all. He has the ability. Now, unto him that is able, he has the ability to do exceedingly. He can't do exceedingly if he doesn't have the abundance. Watch what Haggai says about God. God says in Haggai, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Psalm 50, verse 10, For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. God is the owner of it all. No matter who wants to place a claim on something in this world, it doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God, and he lends it to us, praise his holy name. And that's why we're supposed to be good stewards of that which he's entrusted to us. The story is told about the Dallas Theological Seminary that was founded in 1924. Shortly after it was founded, it almost folded. It came to the point of bankruptcy. All the creditors were ready to floor close at 12 noon on a particular day. That morning, that particular day, the founders of the school met in the president's office to pray that God would provide. In that prayer meeting was a great preacher by the name of Harry Ironside. I'm sure Brother Joe has heard that name. When it was Brother Ironside's turn to pray, he said in a refreshingly candid way, watch his prayer, listen, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are, not, are thine. Please sell some of them, of them and send us the money. Just about that time, a big, tall, lanky cowboy in boots, scarf around his neck, there in the prayer room, secretaries at the front desk. He just sold two, cat, two uh, truckloads of his cattle. He walked in with the check and said to the secretary, you know what? I just sold two truckloads of cattle, and God told me to give the money to the seminary. The secretary knew what was going on. She interrupts the prayer meeting, hands the check to the president. He recognized the name on the check as being a cattle uh, owner there in his community, and he screams out, and he said, Hey, Harry, God sold the cattle. Now, you know what? Wouldn't you like to have some stories like that in your life? Wouldn't you? I can testify. She can testify with me after story after story after story of almost 40 years of ministry, how God has provided miraculously. I told God a long time ago, as a young Christian, not as a preacher, God, I want to live by faith. Hello? And you know, sometimes we're scared to live by faith. But I told God, I want to live by faith, and as a result of it, I've seen God work in mighty ways. God wants us to tap in to his abundant supply. And we, we quoted Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now let's look at the third thought. But now remember, this is God's part. This is what God does. He's able so he can do it. He has the abundance so he can keep his part of the contract. Well, look at verse 20. Now to him that is able... To do exceeding above, they watch these two words, above all. Above all. God's part of the bargain, and he can keep his part of the bargain, is because he's above all. We are so limited in our view. That's why the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. God has a much better view because he is above all. Watch what he says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, say those. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. That's why I need to get the plugged in into the thoughts of God. I need to get the plugged in into the mind of God. Watch now. I need to get plugged in into the heart of God. I need to know his heart. You say, well, man, that sounds complicated. No, it's not. It's right here. It's right here. This isn't everything that God knows. This is everything God wants you to know. It's not everything he knows. I mean, John said of Jesus, there's not enough books and paper around to tell you everything that Jesus said or did. But contained in this book, watch now, is the heart and mind 
of that abundant God who is able, he's above all, his wisdom is high, but watch that we can reach up to the heart and mind of God and wisdom, and he'll share it, or he wouldn't give us the promise in James, where he says, if any man lacks wisdom, if any man lacks, that's me, watch now, he says that we can come to him, watch now, and he'll give liberally, but we must believe, he says, we must believe. He has the abundance of all. He is above all. Not only is God higher in his point of view, but he's also above all in authority. Colossians 1.18, speaking of Christ, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Do you know what preeminence means? Someone tell me. First place. See, my life was all about me. And after I got saved, Matthew 6.33 became a strong, challenging verse in my life. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I, was, I had that upside down, all the things added unto me, and maybe there was a little God on the bottom, but I was lost, but I had some religion, you know. But after I got saved, I turned Matthew 6.33 right side up, hello, and put him first. Christ is supposed to have the preeminence. When... When the Penn family came to the United States to establish the state of Pennsylvania, the king then had borrowed a lot of money from the Penn family to support a war. I don't know what war I could find out. But he gave them the land that we call Pennsylvania as payment for what he owed them. William Penn was a devout Christian. Matter of fact, he was a Quaker. He was a Quaker. And in a Quaker's life, Nothing can be first. Nothing can be first. So when William Penn was designing the streets of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, all right? And by, matter of fact, I've traveled in Philadelphia, and I, Julie has too, and it's one of the easiest major cities in America to travel in because all the streets and roads are east and west. Recently, they've added one diagonal street. And if you come to the city of Philadelphia, because William Penn designed it, he's a Quaker, nothing can be first, you will, and the streets are numbered, you will find no first street. You'll find second, you'll find third, fourth, and on, but you won't find the front. How can you have a second without a first? He's a Quaker. Christ has the preeminence. Nothing can be first, not even a street. So what is first street called? Front street. It goes front street, second, third, fourth. If a Quaker wouldn't name a street after Jesus because he's supposed to have the preeminence, what is he supposed to be in our life? He's supposed to come before everything. Christ needs to have the preeminence. Why? Because he's the head of the church. He's above all. He has the, the total authority. This is why we can look to him with great expectation. Watch what the psalmist writes. I will lift up mine eyes up unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Now, I'm going to surprise you. I'm getting to the fourth point, the fourth and last point. Now, I want you to look with me, please, back at verse 20. It's amazing how much you can draw out of one verse. Huh? It's all there. Okay, we're talking about God's part of the bargain, God's part of the contract, great expectations, why we can expect great things to happen, expect great things from God, expect great things for God, William Carey said. He said, now unto him that is able, he has all the ability, do exceedingly abundantly, he has the abundance, above all, he's above all in wisdom, in, in authority. Now watch, now. all that we ask or think according, according to the power that worketh in us. The fourth point is that God always does accordingly. He always does accordingly. Brother Joe, don't you wish that all Christians would do it accordingly? Here's accordingly. At the invitation, when you present the gospel, the according thing to do is to come to the altar and get saved. That's accordingly. After you get saved, the accordingly thing to do is to get baptized. After you get baptized, the according, accordingly thing to do is to join the church. The accordingly thing to do after that is to get a stack of tithing envelopes and start tithing. Hello, quiet in here. That's accordingly. God does things accordingly. 
If doesn't the Bible say that everything should be done decently and in order? It's according to his power. It's according to empty tomb resurrection power. Watch what it says there. According to the power that worketh in us, God does accordingly uh, to the, according to the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Watch what he says. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Here's what Paul is saying. I don't just want to know what came out of the tomb. All of us want to know that. That's Easter. Hello? That's resurrection morning. That's the angel saying to Mary, oh, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? We all want that. We all want to know about the, two, the, the stone that was rolled away. We all want to know about the gardener. We all want to know about the, 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 the burial clothes that were laying. And empty. We all want to know about the resurrection. But Paul says, I'm not stopping there. That's not enough for me. That I may know him, the power of resurrection, watch now, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul says, I don't want to just know what came out of the tomb. I want to relate and associate with that which went into the tomb. That's, most Christians don't want to relate to that. They, they don't want to relate to a bloody Savior. They want to relate to a glorified Savior. They want the pretty Savior. They want the, the resurrected Christ. And we all want that. That's the ultimate goal. But watch out. If we're really going to identify with the God who does great things for us, who keeps his bargain, then watch now. We need to identify with the suffering of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our life, who for the joy that was set before him, watch church, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says, For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. You ever get cold? Don't answer. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Don't raise your hand. You ever get cold towards Christ? Does the Bible ever now and then doesn't speak to you like it once did? Do you ever feel like sometimes your prayers get as high as the ceiling? Oh, you, you go to church. You teach Sunday school. You preach the sermon. <laughs> you do all that you're supposed to because you're faithful no matter what. In season, out of season. Preach the word. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Whenever that happens to me, do you know what I do? I stroll through the last chapters of the four Gospels. What's the last chapters of the four Gospels? The crucifixion. I go back to the cross. I go back and see a suffering Savior. I go back and see a Savior who was spit upon. I go back and see a Savior who put a crown of, they put a crown of thorns on his sacred brow. I go back to a Savior that they took the Roman cat of nine tails, nine strips of leather and a wooden handle with bone and, and metal uh, and stone wrapped into that leather strips. And I, I see him and the flesh being pulled from his back and the sinew. I go to a Savior and I see him uh, with nails in his hands and his feet. And watch now, I hear him. I hear him say seven things, and the one that impresses me the most is when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you know what that does? It brings me closer to him. Isn't there a song we sing, Nearer to the Cross? Doesn't that make sense? Huh? We sang it last night. <laughs> Nearer to the Cross. James says, draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. To come before him with clean hands, with a clean heart, and with a clean head. There's a three-point message for you. Hands, head, and heart. And he will draw an eye to us. You know, that's what we're talking about, aren't we? Him drawing an eye to us. Part of the bargain. Matter of fact, part of the bargain is in that verse. Draw an eye to God. We've got to do our part. You know, why, why, do, why do I have to draw an eye to him? Why don't he just draw an eye to me? He did 2,000 years ago. He left the perfection of heaven where the angels sing for him 24-7, holy, holy, holy. He left the right hand of the Father, came to this wicked planet, walked on cursed earth, and rubbed elbows with sinners. He came. Matter of fact, there's another song. He came to me. Would not, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. 
That's his part to do. You think he'll do his part? Sure, because he has all the ability. Because of his abundance. Because he's able to do it. He has all the ability. Because he does above all, watch now, and he does accordingly. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in him. Tomorrow night, we will talk about our part of the body, our responsibility to the contract with God. Heads about and eyes are closed and no one looking around. Who tonight would say, Preacher, I'm so glad that God keeps this part of the body. Would you raise your hands if that's what you think and you know, stand by? Let me put your hands up. Who would say, Preacher, I want that God to have first place in my life. I want him to be number one. Would you put your hands up all over the auditorium? God bless you, put your hands down. Now let me say this, and then I'm going to send you in the first place. Life can be hard. It could throw us curves. It could devastate us and drop us to our knees. But that doesn't change the person of God. What you and I go through doesn't change who God is. And I know that you may be living through some trials, some temptations, some tests. And that's the God you need to come to tonight. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I'll pray. And then the invitation will be open. Maybe we can have the instruments play during the invitation. Father in heaven, we bragged on you tonight. You always keep your part of the bargain. You always hold up your end of the contract we who fail. Thank you, Father, for being the God who's able, the God who has an abundance of all, the God who's above all, and the God who always does according. Thank you that you are a God who's decent and in order in everything he does. Father, you know the needs here tonight. There are hands raised. If that's the type of God they want, we give you first place. I pray, Father, that there are those who come to this altar to take care of some things with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you come right now? The invitation is open. Can we get an instrument?